But in Columbus, Georgia, we do big things. For goodness sake, we converted a dammed up mill river to the longest urban whitewater course in the world. In Columbus, Georgia, we conquer our challenges, we prepare for our future, and we take advantage of our opportunities. And I'd like to share with you just a few of those opportunities here today. The first is inner city high-speed passenger rail. This is the era of mid-sized cities. Columbus, Georgia is in the sweet spot of livability. From empty nesters to Gen Xers to millennials, all generations are longing for a city small enough to offer community connection with character enough to offer authenticity and cultural identity, but sophisticated enough to serve the demands and interest of those citizens who could choose to live anywhere. Mid-sized cities with a population of roughly 200,000 to 500,000 tend to fit this bill nicely. Columbus, Georgia fits this bill precisely. And so the question becomes, how do we not only make a superior quality of life for our current citizens, but how do we grow this Columbus, Georgia pie to become a major economic cultural hub of the southeastern United States? In 2011, we initiated the Mayor's Commission on High Speed Passenger Rail. I will tell you a not well-kept secret. This commission was not launched out of any grand vision I had that high speed passenger rail would become a reality. The truth is, we were concerned that there were various high speed passenger rail studies being conducted. Atlanta to Charlotte, Atlanta to Louisville, Atlanta to Birmingham, Atlanta to Jacksonville. And in the midst of all of that, concept discussions began of inner city rail. Atlanta to Macon, Atlanta to Savannah, Atlanta to Chattanooga, Atlanta to Athens. Nowhere was there mention of inner city rail to Columbus. As a student of history and the newly elected mayor of this great city, there was no way I was going to have another great lapse of progress akin to the 1960s decision to forego the connection of the nation's interstate system to Columbus, Georgia. We decided we should convene a commission to begin looking at the possibility of high-speed passenger rail from Columbus to Atlanta, and then perhaps someday on to Mobile, Alabama and Tallahassee, Florida. Representatives Calvin Smyre and local attorney Ed Hudson agreed to co-chair the commission. We conferenced in many experts via Skype, including now Secretary of Transportation Anthony Fox and Governor Pat McCroy of North Carolina to talk to us about Charlotte's journey to an inner city rail system. We found state grant money to fund a $360,000 feasibility study thanks to private donors and to Sam Welburn who sits on the Passenger Rail Commission and who also is a board member of the Georgia Department of Transportation. Following a request for proposal process, the experienced transportation consulting firm of HNTB out of Atlanta was engaged for a tier one high speed passenger rail feasibility study from the Columbus Airport to Hartsville Jackson International Airport in Atlanta. And now we know the following. The primary proposed design of the Columbus to Atlanta rail line is to have a high speed electric train with top speeds of between 150 and 220 miles an hour up I-185 to I-85 along state-owned right-of-way. The express train would require approximately 90 miles of rail and would reach Atlanta within 61 minutes with one stop in noon in Georgia. The estimated cost of a one-way ticket on the express line is expected to be $41.42, which is very competitive with travel to Atlanta. The electric express rail could be completed in 16 years, about the length of time it takes to have a large bridge built or a major road expansion completed. The 2030 express rail ridership, including the Noonan stop, is estimated to be 1.1 million one-way trips. The revenues from the tickets and other associated goods would exceed the cost 
of the rail's maintenance and operation in the first year of its operation, making the line profitable and capable of paying off any bonds needed for rail construction. The 90-mile electric rail line would cost an approximate $3.9 billion, assuming a generous 30% contingency, which cost is in line with other rail and other major transportation projects. Its construction cost would be paid for from grant monies, federal and state transportation monies, state bond initiatives, and innovative public-private partnerships. And the express rail between Columbus and Atlanta is estimated to create a minimum of 11,000 jobs. A minimum of 11,000 jobs. That's the equivalent of four Kia plants. True, this Tier 1 feasibility study is the first leg in a long journey of a potentially transformative resource for our city, but it is a city, it is a, it is a step no other city in the state of Georgia has taken. Now Columbus, Georgia is at the forefront of the line of intercity high-speed passenger rail, and if any city is prepared for potential federal, state, and private investment, it is us. This study will be finalized in the near future and an additional community input process will begin. We are not talking Amtrak here. We are talking about the high-speed connection of economic resources in Columbus and Atlanta to include our university system, our hospital system, our air transportation system, and our business community. In essence, Columbus would be a bedroom community of Atlanta or Atlanta would be a bedroom community to Columbus. With Columbus having the size and the charm and the character and the sophistication to make it more desirable to many. Our second great opportunity is called City Village. Columbus has a long history of being a manufacturing city. With recent expansions at Pratt Whitney, NCR, Macaulay Propeller, we remain strong in the manufacturing industry sector. However, there is a new industry of today and the future, and that is the creative industry. These are the software designers, the techies, the innovators, the architects, and the artists that companies need to see the world in a new way. More and more companies within these industries are looking for mid-sized cities that offer a unique quality of life. A recent example of that is the construction of Google's southeastern campus in Nashville. These economic generators can be headquartered anywhere with today's technology, and the particularities of the creative industry allow them to be placed anywhere as well. We have to ask, is Columbus, Georgia capable of attracting these types of high-paying, highly desirable jobs that bring the best and the brightest to any community in which they like, they liked? And the answer is a qualified yes. But we certainly could be a location of choice for this new industry. Again, we are a mid-sized city. We have a unique quality of life asset in the Whitewater Course in our uptown district. We offer an authentic cultural experience. We do not suffer from the unappealing generica syndrome that makes so many communities a non-starter for these economic opportunities. Columbus has a sophisticated environment of uh, including Fortune 500 companies, a strong cultural arts community, and one of the largest military training bases in the world. Incredibly, Columbus has roughly 30 city blocks of property, largely in the hands of governmental agencies, which sits on the riverbanks of the Chattahoochee. The area is known on our 19th century city map as City Village. It stretches from just north of Total Systems to just south of Bibb City. To the east, it is bordered by Second Avenue and to the west by breathtaking views of the Chattahoochee River. This development opportunity has been analyzed to rave reviews by the U.S. Mayor's Institute on City Design. The opportunity has been referred to by Joe Riley, the long-serving mayor of Charleston, South Carolina, and one of the nation's premier city planners, as Columbus's Central Park or Columbus's 
Boston Commons. A group of community stakeholders has been convened, chaired by Phil Tomlinson of Tesis and Marquette McKnight of Bibb Village. The group is administered by Historic Columbus. The stakeholders groups include churches, organizations, property owners, elected officials, members of, creative, of the creative industry. Their objective is to create a vision for the village that encourages mixed use and mixed income development and attracts participants of the creative industry. Their objective also includes a vision for the redevelopment of the Second Avenue Corridor, a gateway into Columbus. This group is only just convened. But this time next year, we expect them to be concluding a planning study of precisely how we should proceed in order to take full advantage of this once in a century opportunity for redeveloping an in-town community. Our third great opportunity is South Columbus redevelopment. Probably the greatest potential we have in the city lies in South Columbus. This area has too long suffered from the disinvestment because like every other urbanized city in the country, the planners and the leaders of the day knew no different. Sometimes a renaissance or renewal is too long in coming, but it does arrive, and when it does, it's right on time. That's not to say there hasn't been significant progress made towards the renaissance. In fact, you can see the areas of renewal appearing on the map like a paint-by-numbers image where you add the paint colors one at a time to a numbered canvas, being able to discern the image or the form only near the end of the completion of the painting. Here, we already have painted in the greens of the National Infantry Museum, the military graduations and events that take place there, and the new hotel adjacent to the museum. We have painted in the blues of Oxbow Meadows development with the new dog park, pavilion, and the Westville Living Museum soon to come. We have painted in the yellows of removed blight to include the elimination of the hole on Wade Street, the majestic sports bar, and the Woodside Apartments on Victory Drive. We have painted in the orange of the 500 residential units at Arbor Point with superior mixed income housing units and amenities. Soon to come, we will have additional colors to add to the canvas due to the investments of the South Lumpkin Road Streetscape Project and the South Lumpkin Road Rails to Trails Project. In many communities in the world, the most valuable land resource lies adjacent to a body of water. Columbus, Georgia is no different. South Columbus is bordered by the Chattahoochee River and the region's largest employer, Fort Benning. That, when coupled with the affordable land cost, the federal, state, and local investment incentives provides for a powerful pack of potential that we are nurturing, growing, and harvesting every day. And now for the last opportunity I'll share with you today, it's our 10-year plan to end homelessness. Around the country, the most forward-thinking cities are adopting a housing-first strategy to eventually end homelessness as we know it. In Columbus, we have approximately 1,500 people experiencing homelessness on any given day. And yet, some 90% of our homeless could sustain their own long-term housing if one or more of the conditions leading to their homelessness was removed. So in 2011, we adopted a 10-year plan to end homelessness, which plan seeks to put housing first by finding sustainable long-term housing options for our homeless. Under our city's plan, by 2021, we will see homelessness in Columbus, Georgia as atypical, temporary, and non-reoccurring. At that point, we can shift our resources toward preventing homelessness and rapidly responding to instances of homelessness. Our progress toward the 10-year plan has been remarkable. We have created an organization called Home for Good to implement the 10-year plan together with other community partners. Our housing authority has received the much sought after moving to work designation, which allows them to have 180 units and vouchers 
for the sustainable housing of the homeless. Home for Good has received $1.5 million in gap financing to see through the construction of these housing units. And we have convened the Mayor's Opportunity Center Task Force to design the one-stop shop called for by the plan. Which shop will marshal efficiently the resources available to our homeless? This Opportunity Center is not a shelter. It is a case management facility where homeless clients are compassionately triaged and assigned to services they need in order to sustain their own long-term housing. We have seen an unprecedented collaboration among the city, homeless service providers, and faith-based organizations while seeking to achieve this Opportunity Resource Center. The model being formed by the Opportunity Resource Center Task Force is one that puts housing first. The concept has been successful in places like Salt Lake City and Houston. In 2014, you will see our task force propose an Opportunity Resource Center and come one step closer to fulfilling our 10-year plan to end homelessness as we know it in Columbus, Georgia. So to recap, we are a city that has turned a mill river into one of the 12 greatest man-made adventures on the planet. We are a city that has unanimously enacted broad-scale pension reform while that reform has eluded other cities and then bankrupted them. We are a city whose primary challenge is to correct fiscal issues we know the answers to, but must find the courage and consensus to enact. We are a city that sits in the sweet spot of a new era of growth. And we are a city that sits on the threshold of high-speed passenger rail to Atlanta, redeveloping our riverfront in the city village, seeing a renaissance in South Columbus, and ending homelessness as we know it. Yes, indeed, in Columbus, Georgia, we do big things. And it is my honor and privilege to serve this great city as its 69th mayor. I can say firmly and proudly that we have only just begun, that our city has never been more alive, and that our best days lie ahead of us. What a great time to live in Columbus, Georgia. The state of our city is strong. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for uh, that en enlightenment about where we're headed. You know, there are some cities that have uh, a lot of folks, they call them the nope people, not on planet Earth. Uh, and there are some people that have a lot of nimby people, not in my backyard. Thank goodness, I think our city is full of a lot of folks who have vision, compassion, and a commitment to make things happen one way or the other. And I think the public-private partnership has never been brighter. Mayor, thank you once again for your time. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Paige Scranton, uh, Sprouse, Tucker, and Ford. Uh, thank all of our sponsors. We really appreciate all of you making time to be here today. This is a, a, one of our big events, but guess what? We've got an event every day almost, uh, and we look forward. We'll have more forums coming up because we've got some elections coming up, uh, and we'll have forums where you'll be able to come and hear the candidates and incumbents talk about their issues. We thank you for being a member of our chamber. We thank you for your support, and we look forward to continuing to serve you in any and every way possible. We think it's good to make money in Columbus, and we'll continue to do so with our strong public-private partnership working together. Thank you all for being here. We are adjourned. <laughs>